How long is this gonna take? So much for taking care of me. Lex, starting today, I'm locking your phone and laptop away. Cruel! Isn't one leg cast enough punishment? Excuse me, you don't deserve to have a say in this. If you hadn't bought our daughter that death trap motorbike in the first place, she'd still be intact. Yeah, sorry for making sure she doesn't grow up boring like her mom. Yeah, another lecture on how irresponsible I was eventually turned into a quarrel between mom and dad instead. They stopped only when mom needed to leave for her business trip in Egypt. I'm done arguing with you. I have a flight to catch. I've got my eye on you, young lady. All the way from Egypt? That's kinda hard. Well, at least dad's here, so I won't be by myself. The next morning, I woke up to see a note stuck to the fridge. Alex, I'm shooting my new movie in Spain for a few months. There is a strict no phone policy to avoid leaks. So if it isn't urgent, don't call me. Love, dad. Seriously? Choosing work over me? Why am I still surprised? That's when you get when you have a world-famous actor dad and an award-winning photographer mom. They're rarely home, and whenever they are, they're constantly at each other's throats. All the more reason for me to hang out with my biker gang. I love motorcycles. They're my only getaway. But that's how I messed up my leg. In my defense, I could totally nail that trick and win their stupid bet if it wasn't for that bumpy road. However, not a single one of my homies has checked on me since then. Not even my boyfriend, Blake. But what's really bumming me out is that school's out for summer, yet I can hardly move. So, bored out of my mind, I came up with a new way to entertain myself, which was playing candid camera on this whole suburbia. Thanks to my mom's camera, I had eyes on the newlyweds Cunninghams on the right, the Carpenters on the left, a few other houses, and, ooh, tiny Timmy across the street. I swear to God, I almost thought some hunky guy had just moved in. My childhood friend, Tiny Timmy, had officially grown into Timothy. He looked just like a muscular version of Timothy Chalamet. Then Tim suddenly sat up and we accidentally made eye contact. Awkward. Looking good, handsome. He's even cuter when he smiles. Oh, he's replying. Even better up close. That's bold, Timmy. Too bad, though. Sorry, lame. Tim looks confused at first. Then when he saw my cast, he immediately leaves the room. Huh? A broken leg is enough to scare him off? He's lame. Then the doorbell rang. Hey, that took a while. You're here? Of course, you need to have a closer look. And could use a hand. Or a leg. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> come help this damsel in distress. From then on, Tim came over every day to help me out around the house. He'd been really helpful and even tried riding my motorcycle so it didn't have to sit idle for too long. Other than that bulked up body, he's still the friend I knew back in the day. We still had so much fun playing video games and watching movies together. You have to watch Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. It's nuts. Actually, I thought you might be into Ladybird. Such a heartwarming coming-of-age story. Ew, no way. Timothy Chalamet is in it. Okay, sold. But how do you know that it'd sway me? I just do. Like how I know you spy on me from time to time, which, by the way, is super creepy. Yeah, right. As if he didn't intentionally leave his blinds open while working out, Mr. Shy Guy. One day, as usual, me and Tim were hanging out, when suddenly, my dear boyfriend, Blake, made a noisy entrance. Babe, you won't believe this. There's a raising tournament going on in the Upper West Side. You have to come. What's going on here? Sup. What do you mean, sup? Who's this little brat? Oh, this is Tim. Tim, this is Blake. Say hi. Hi. I don't care. What do you think you're doing? Watch your tongue. You've been ignoring me for weeks, and now you show up raving on about some dumb street racing contest? You don't even remember that I broke my leg, do you? But, but, you're mine! Blake was fuming like a bull ready for battle, and about to throw hands at Tim, but he stopped his fist midair. A defeated-looking Blake fled off as soon as he got out of Tim's grip. Coward. I apologized to Tim for dragging him into this mess, and he was surprisingly cool about it. Just curious. How did Blake and you become a thing? He's the leader of the biker gang, so I thought he was cool. But honestly, I never expected our relationship to last. Just like every other couple's. Exhibit A, my parents. I see. My dad's a good example as well. Then Tim revealed that his dad left his mom for another woman last year, which really upset him. I could relate so much to his situation. 
Maybe being locked up at home wasn't so bad after all, since we had the chance to catch up on everything. But the following morning, when I was chilling in my room, something horrible caught my eye. Something blonde. It looked like she was returning a hoodie to Tim. What kind of friend borrows a hoodie and acts like that around each other? Let's see what he has to say for himself. Who's that blonde? What was she doing at your place today? What? Who? She might look like strawberry shortcake, but don't be fooled. Whatever love you two might think you have will soon fade. That sweetness will turn sour in no time. Tim just burst out laughing. What's so funny? What made you think so? You don't even know Annabelle. Don't believe me? See for yourself. I then showed him all of the secrets I'd uncovered in our seemingly quiet neighborhood. First off, the couple from number 9 were both having affairs. The daughter from number 11 was using her boyfriend to hide her real relationship with another girl. And last but not least, the Carpenters, who seemed like suburban couples goal, actually had a far from blissful life due to Mr. Carpenter's drinking problem. In conclusion, there's no such thing as real love. I see your point, but on the other side of the spectrum, genuine love does exist. Tim points the camera towards the Cunninghams. Hmm, I'm not buying their poster couple act. Then, one day, Tim said he had to work overtime at the library to prepare for an event with, you guessed it, Annabelle only. I had to hide my anger as I watched him drive off with Blondie. With nothing else to do, I decided to watch the Cunninghams. Jeez, how could they seem so lovey-dovey all the time? I wanted to take my mind off of Tim, but the more I observed them, the more I thought about him with that Barbie. That's when I saw a book that Tim borrowed for me from the library. Looks like it's time to return it. I ubered there, but there are many people here as well. Why did Tim say that the two of them would be here alone? Tim's face turned into the scream when he saw me. Didn't think I could get this far? Hi, don't mind me. I'm just here to return this. You should have just given it to me. Oh god, no. I can see that you're busy with... Annabelle, isn't it? Yeah. How do you know my name? Oh, let's see. You remind me of that creepy doll who's also an absolute nightmare. Tim then immediately dragged me away. See? He's caring for me, not you, Annie. However, the fun was interrupted right away when I saw Blake outside. Time for you to pay. Tim immediately stood between Blake and me, but to our surprise, Blake signaled for his goons hiding close by to show themselves. Clearly outnumbered, I tried to stop the situation from getting worse. Let's be civilized here. We can sort this out without violence. You're right, babe. We can settle this with a bet. Whoever can do the trick that broke Lex's leg and top it off with the Akira slide can have her fair and square. The loser has to back down. First of all, I'm not some kind of trophy. Second of all, that stunt is incredibly dangerous. Right, Tim? Sounds worth it, though. Have both of you lost your minds? Tim went first, and even though he flunked it, he managed to land without a scratch, while Blake landed on his face. Of course, that fiasco got the whole gang so embarrassed, they scrammed immediately. But I was still so annoyed. Congratulations, you won absolutely nothing. Not that I didn't care about him, I just couldn't stand his recklessness anymore. The next day, I was woken up by a doorbell. So, what are you here for? Sorry about last night. But if you stayed longer, I could have told you that I did what I did because I like you. Romantic styles. I don't even remember since when, but I do remember how sad I was when we stopped hanging out. Believe it or not, I started working out just to impress you. Whoa, what? Tim explained that nothing was going on between Annabelle and him. They were simply co-workers. And he made up that whole thing about being alone with her at the library to see my reaction. What do you say? I can make you believe in love. Tim, don't be ridiculous. Love isn't anything like the movies. It's merely a temporary chemical reaction in your brain that makes you think you're really feeling it. Come on, just give it a chance. No, look at my parents, your father, all the families in this neighborhood. If you ask me, your feelings for me right now will fade, just like mine with Blake. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I thought I was special enough for you to take a leap of faith. Now I know how wrong I was. He then left without another word. When Tim closed his blinds, honestly, I felt a sting in my chest. This is for the best, right? I can't deny the uneasiness I felt without Tim. It's not that he didn't want us to make up. I just didn't know how. 
Seeing how happy and smiley he was with her, my uneasy feeling only grew bigger. Is this what they call love? No, no, no. It's not real. Happy-looking families are not actually happy, and the Cunninghams are just good at faking it. What's that I'm hearing? Are they fighting? I saw the husband suddenly punch the wall with rage, then push the wife. I no longer had eyes on them, but could hear a huge commotion over there. What on earth is going on? Panicked, I called the cops right away. Wait a second, that means their happy marriage really was fake. I excitedly limped across the street to tell Tim about my discovery, then dragged him over to the Cunningham's front lawn. However, when the cops arrived, both of them answered the door perfectly fine. Turns out they already knew about my spying, and were so annoyed by it, they decided to pull a prank on me. Great, my curious neighbors have also witnessed this whole humiliating ordeal. But the worst part was seeing the disappointment on Tim's face. You have to stop being so stubborn. Not every family is like yours. I couldn't say a word, not even when the cops gave me a warning. That night, I tossed and turned as Tim's words wiggled around my mind. Suddenly, something caught my attention. It's from Tim's house. Some flashlights were moving around. I tried calling Tim, but he didn't answer. Of course, he'd be in deep sleep by now. Calling the cops was useless because of that very recent embarrassing incident. That's it. I'm doing it myself. Out there on Tim's front lawn, my heart was beating like crazy. Thieves! Thieves! The startled thieves turned around, so I blared the air horn, then shouted. Freeze! Stay where you are! Hands over your heads! But, obviously, I, a teenager with one working leg, never actually expected any criminal to stand still. They quickly got a hold of me, and right when I thought my life was over, get away from her! Tim, thank goodness! Other neighbors also came and stopped the thieves. Tim called the cops, and this time, they reported to the scene ASAP. Phew, that was insane. Mrs. Jones, Tim's mom, thanked me and invited me to stay the night. It's really nice of her, even though she burst out laughing when I explained the situation with the Cunninghams. When Tim went to grab some drinks for us, she asked me why I was alone in this condition. So, I spilled everything about my family. Contrary to her reaction just now, she showed me sympathy. From her experience, love didn't always have a happy ending, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Tim's dad and I had genuine feelings for each other. It's just that over time, things changed. We're open to accept this and be honest with each other. That's what real love is. I wouldn't change a thing and I would still fall crazily in love with him, despite knowing we would eventually break up. Because that's how I got Tim, the second real love of my life. Her words hit different. Maybe I'd given love a bad name. You're right, love is not at fault. And Tim is so lucky to have a loving mom like you. Meanwhile, my parents don't just hate each other, they put it all on me too. Bet you, even tonight's incident won't make them care. I see where you're coming from, but why don't you just give it a try? Their reactions might surprise you. So, I called them up, and guess what? They both sounded concerned on the phone and said they'd come home as soon as they could. See, I told you so. It's alright now. Timmy, please show Lex where she'll be sleeping. That was really brave of you. Being all heroic out there despite your whole situation. I wouldn't have risked my life if it wasn't for- If it wasn't for what? I'm all ears. For you. I'm sorry I overreacted. The thought of becoming a boring old couple who hate each other bugged me. But then I realized if we were together, we wouldn't have to be that. We could be like the Cunninghams. That doesn't sound too bad now, does it? I guess not. Next morning, I woke up to my parents' call. They actually kept their promise this time. My mom explained that she thought dad was home to take care of me, while dad absentmindedly assumed mom only left in a fit of anger and was going to return soon. So they really do care about me. They just have a terrible way of showing it. They stayed together, thinking it would be best for me. But the unending tension and bickering was eating us all up from the inside. This incident opened their eyes, so they agreed to have a peaceful divorce while still looking after me together. I'm finally free from the cast, but I actually feel even more liberated than before. Is this the power of my newfound belief in love? Is it because I've realized that love was around me all along? I'm not sure myself, but who cares? Alex and Timothy signing off. Hi, I'm Diane, and I'm 20 years old. I fell in love on the first day of college. I'm not even joking. 
I'd promised my mom I'd focus on my studies and wouldn't fall for any boys. But one look at Brett, and I broke that promise immediately. We had an instant connection, and pretty soon we were spending every waking moment together. I can't help but think that if I hadn't met him, maybe I'd never have found out the dark secret my mom and aunt had been hiding from me my whole life. You see, my mom raised me alone, and I had no idea who my dad was. Let's just say it seemed like my mom got around, so she really didn't want me to get into the same kind of situation as her. I decided to keep Brett a secret. She didn't need to know, right? When I went home for Christmas vacation, I missed Brett so much, but I couldn't let my mom know about him. So I'd wait until she went to bed before calling him. One night, she caught me, though. She must have gone to the bathroom, and suddenly I heard footsteps. She was standing right there. I didn't know how much she heard, but I was so embarrassed. I thought she'd grab the phone from me and tell me off, but instead, she just walked back to bed. It was so weird. In the morning, she was sitting at the kitchen table grinning and said, Well, who is he then? Invite him over. Don't be shy. I couldn't believe it. I thought she'd freak out, but instead she wanted to meet him. She suggested we invited him over for dinner, as my aunt was also coming over that night. My mom and my aunt were like best friends and had basically raised me together, so I was excited for her to meet Brett too. He took the bus that afternoon, as he was desperate to see me, and my mom said he could stay in the spare room. As soon as my mom saw Brett, she grinned at me and whispered how handsome he was. Then we sat down to dinner and started chatting. My mom had so many questions for him, and it was a bit awkward. She wouldn't shut up, and it made her seem so nosy. She asked where he'd grown up, and what his mom and dad did, and even asked for their names and stuff. Meanwhile, my aunt just sat there quietly, and then at one point she got up from the table and went out into the garden. My mom ran after her, and Brett looked at me worried. I had no idea what was wrong. Ten minutes later, my mom came in and her expression had totally changed. She went from being warm and friendly to totally strict and cold. She looked at both Brett and I and said she decided I was far too young to have a boyfriend staying over, and then asked Brett to leave. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was 20 years old. She was being so rude. So I said to her, Mom, why? Please, can he just stay? I was almost begging her, but she looked so serious and firm, and I knew she wasn't going to change her mind. Brett was even more shocked than me. I mean, it had been my mom who'd invited him in the first place, and now there she was, shooing him away. He quickly grabbed his stuff and ordered a taxi. I was so upset I didn't even say bye to him. I just burst into tears and felt so angry at my mom. Right after Brett left, I ran upstairs and locked myself in my room, and my mom stood on the other side begging to speak to me. She said there was something she needed to tell me. I refused to come out and instead sat on the floor on the other side of the door. I could hear my mom crying and knew this was serious. She said the reason she didn't want Brett to stay was because he was actually my half-brother. No. I didn't understand. I asked if my dad was also Brett's dad, and then I got angry. I thought my mom hadn't known who my dad was. I opened the door and I was about to start shouting at her when she told me what was really going on. I'd been adopted. Well, actually, I'd been kidnapped by my aunt when I was born. It's a long, shocking story, but basically my biological parents were this rich couple, but they were struggling to get pregnant. My biological mom had a best friend called Ashley, who she told everything to, but Ashley secretly had a crush on my dad. She seduced my dad until one night they slept together, and Ashley ended up getting pregnant. My dad was so happy and promised Ashley he'd help raise the baby, but that he couldn't divorce my mom. This made Ashley angry. She wanted my dad all to herself, and wanted their kid to become the heir to his company. At the same time, my biological mom fell pregnant with me, and when my dad found out, he quickly forgot about Ashley and tried to forget about the mistake he'd made that one night. This, of course, made Ashley even more angry, but she still pretended to be friends with my mom. When my mom went into labor with me, my dad was away on a business trip, and Ashley paid someone to sneak into the hospital and kidnap me. That person turned out to be my aunt. She did it because she was desperate for cash— 
So she snuck in, dressed up as a nurse, and in the middle of the night stole me away. But she wasn't cold-blooded enough to just throw me away or leave me at an orphanage. So she took me to her sister's place and told her that she'd found me abandoned on the street. Her sister, who had never wanted to get married but had always wanted to be a mom, was so happy and decided to raise me. But then a few days later, it was all over the news, a missing baby. There was an exact description of what I'd been wearing, and even a photo of me just after I'd been born. There was no denying that I was the missing baby. My new mom confronted my aunt about it and found out the truth. My aunt said there was no way they could return me as my aunt had already spent all the money she'd been paid to cover some debts. And she didn't want to go to prison, so they decided to raise me as if I really was their own. That secret would still have been hidden from me if I hadn't brought Brett home. My mom was so shocked that I'd brought my dad and Ashley's son into her home and introduced him to her as my boyfriend. As my mom told me all of this, I just sat there frozen. This was absolutely unbelievable. I felt sick. They'd lied to me all these years. And even worse, my boyfriend was actually my half-brother. My whole life was one big mess. I hate you, mom, and I hate you too, I said to my aunt. You helped that evil monster Ashley get what she wanted, and now you've ruined my life and taken away my family. My mom reached out to hug me, but I didn't want her near me. We both just sat there crying. She tried to calm me down and get me to relax. Then she sighed and said, I'm sorry, I'm truly sorry. Your whole life I've been trying to make it up to you. I thought my love for you would be enough. As for Ashley, well, I heard she didn't get what she wanted in the end. Wait, why? I don't understand. But she successfully kidnapped me, right? I wiped my tears and looked at her. Yes, sweetie, but her main goal was to become your dad's wife. But that obviously didn't happen. Then she continued. After my aunt had kidnapped me, Ashley had given birth to Brett and was so happy thinking that my parents no longer had a baby, and that my dad would now leave my mom and go live with her. But that's not what happened. Yes, their dear daughter was taken away, but my dad still stayed with my mom and loved her even more. My dad didn't get together with Ashley, but apparently my dad had still been helping raise Brett until now. There's definitely no bad blood between them, because I've heard Brett talk about his dad quite a lot. Now there was only one thing for it. I had to find my biological parents and find out the rest of the story. They deserved to know I was alive. But now, what would I do about Brett? I'd have to break up with him somehow. Hey guys, it's me again, Ellie. So in the first part of my story, I told you about how my dad abandoned me and my mom when I was just a kid to go live with his mistress. And that made me never want to date guys. But then I met Brian and we got engaged! Meeting his mom was a huge shock because she was none other than my dad's mistress from all those years ago. I couldn't handle it and decided to get revenge. First, I started working in her company, and then I noticed she had a crush on Clark, the head of the software design department, so I decided to steal him from her, and you won't believe what happened next. One Friday evening after everyone had left, I noticed that Clark was still working. I made him a cup of coffee and asked about how the proposal he was working on was going. We had a pretty nice chat, and I tried to flirt with him. I won't lie, I started to see why Sasha fancied him. He was a really nice guy. I even gave him my number and said if he ever needed any help with the proposal, just to call me. We didn't get to chat for long, though, because Brian suddenly called me and said he was waiting outside. When I got downstairs, he was dressed up in a nice shirt and said he wanted to take me to our favorite restaurant. I was pretty surprised because we hadn't gone on a spontaneous date in a while. We'd both been so busy recently. I ordered my favorite ramen soup, and then I smiled and asked Brian in a teasing way, What's the occasion? You haven't taken me out on a date in ages. I waited for him to reply, and he wouldn't look at me. I started to panic and asked him, Brian, what is it? Is something wrong? Then he told me that he'd just been assigned to manage a big project in New York. He said he needed to fly there the following week, and that the project was expected to last three months. But he said he'd come back every weekend to see me, and that it was just temporary. 
I couldn't even respond. I just stared at him with the noodle hanging out of my mouth. My heart was doing somersaults. Brian started laughing and said, Look at you, Ellie. Your mouth is open so wide you're basically drooling. Come on, I'll be back every weekend. Poor Brian. He didn't even know what I was thinking right now. This coincidence was such a perfect ingredient for my revenge recipe. Because now I could carry out my revenge on his mom without him knowing. Brian had no idea what I was up to. And I felt kind of bad. He really loved me, and I didn't want to hurt him by doing this to his mom, but I had to. I had to get revenge. Nothing else mattered. Later that night, we were watching a movie together in bed, and as the movie ended, Brian said he was exhausted and wanted to go to sleep. But my phone beeped right at that moment. It was a text from Clark. I didn't want Brian to see, so I took my phone to the bathroom to reply to him, and it said, Thanks for your support tonight. Due to that, I had came up with a possible solution for the proposal. For the rest of the night, while Brian slept sweetly next to me, Clark and I texted back and forth all night. So far, it looked like my plan was working. Then, the next week, Brian left for his business trip, and as expected, he was so busy he couldn't make it back every weekend to see me. I missed him so much, but I was also grateful because it gave me time to really get to know Clark. And during those three months, we became quite close. Of course, during that time, Sasha still consistently flirted with Clark. It was super awkward because he clearly wasn't interested. One weekend, we had a team bonding trip and went stand-up paddleboarding. Sasha pretended she couldn't do it and kept asking Clark to help her, but he pretty much ignored her and hung out with our other colleagues instead. And then she asked him to join her for lunch one day, but he said he was busy and I just had to laugh because actually he was having lunch with me. I had to be really careful that she didn't discover I was flirting with Clark, because then I could lose my job and my plan would have failed. Also, not to mention the fact that I was engaged to her son, and if any mom saw her daughter-in-law to be flirting with some other guy, she'd freak out. Honestly, it was nerve-wracking. I was constantly on edge, terrifying that she'd notice what I was up to. And there were a couple of times where she almost caught me. One night, both Clark and I worked late, and we left the office together and planned to go for a drink. But as soon as we got in Clark's car, I saw Sasha pulling into the car park. She spotted Clark and his car. She literally drove her car toward us. Her face was so cheerful that I knew she would walk toward Clark's car when she got out of her car. At that moment, I knew I had to get out of Clark's car ASAP before she noticed me. I excused Clark that I'd left my phone upstairs, and before Clark could have any responses, I got out of his car and ran as fast as I could. Just only when I safely hid behind a big pillar did I stop to breathe and realize that my heart almost exploded from fear. From that time, I was more careful with Sasha, but it was so hard. A day when I was making a move to Clark in his office, I sat close to him and gave him an affectionate look. And someone knocked on the door, I abruptly got off Clark because I thought that was Brian's mom again. I breathed a sigh of relief when realizing it was only Clark's secretary, yet my heart was still beating very rapidly. It was all worth it, though. After two months of flirting with him, he confessed to me that he liked me. When I read the text from him, I was so happy I actually squealed. I'd done it. Now for part two of my plan. I was going to use Clark to find out exactly how I could make Sasha's company collapse into a million little pieces. So, when Clark asked me to be his girlfriend, I agreed, but on one condition, that we kept it a secret. Clark agreed to this because he knew there would be lots of troubles if Sasha found out. And honestly, Clark treated me so nicely, even nicer than Brian did. He showered me in gifts and he really listened to me. Anytime I told him I liked something, he remembered and would surprise me with it the next time I saw him. At work, we had to keep things on the down low, but every morning I'd find a handwritten love note in the drawer of my desk. It really made me feel guilty because it was clear Clark liked me a lot, and there I was, just using him for revenge. The company was about to release the new app they'd been working on for the past year, and it was expected to make the company gain a huge market share and beat all its competitors, including my old company. So, I started doing overtime with Clark, so that I could get access to the info on how the software for this app had been created. It was top secret info, and as a junior project manager, I had no right to this info. My old company would love to get their hands on this confidential info, and with it, they could easily kick Sasha's company to the curb and dominate the market. Then, she'd have lost not just her crush, but also her career. 
served her right for what she did to me and my family. One night, after we'd worked super late, he turned to me and said, We should get going. I'm exhausted. He went to the toilet before we left and asked me to sort out the documents. As soon as he left the room, I took photos of the app development plan and all the different steps in creating the software. This was like gold, but Clark was too quick. He came back before I'd managed to take a pic of the last document. Dang. Now I just need to find another opportunity to get that last bit of info. But I had to act quickly because the app was about to be released and my old company was urging me to send the documents ASAP. That night, I felt so anxious that I couldn't sleep. What was I playing at? I mean, sure, I wanted to get revenge on Sasha. She deserved it. But this would crush Brian, who I really did love. And then what about Clark? He liked me so much and had no clue that I was just using him. He'd be devastated if he found out. How had I gone from being an independent single girl with no interest in guys to the kind of girl who two-timed? I couldn't stop thinking about it all, but I had to focus. The revenge plan needed to go ahead. The next morning, I woke up feeling exhausted, but luckily it was the weekend. I'd arranged to go over to Clark's place to try and get my hands on that last document, but unfortunately, Clark wasn't interested in talking about work. He said it was the weekend and he just wanted to relax with me. Then he suggested we rent bikes and cycle over the Golden Gate Bridge and have a picnic to watch the sunset. Wow, it ended up being the best day ever. I felt so happy and I hadn't realized how funny Clark could be. We laughed non-stop and I didn't want the day to end. We kissed under the sunset. How romantic it was. But little did I know what was waiting for me at home. I was swaying to the music with the hottest girl at school in my arms. Everything was perfect when suddenly I saw a flurry of red storming toward me and then the next thing I knew, I was being slapped across the face. Ugh, it was my ex, Rosie. She was looking at me as if she wanted to snap me in half. Okay, so Rosie and me had only broken up yesterday. But that didn't mean she had the right to go full psycho on me. Hey, so I'm Andrew and I like to think I'm a pretty smart guy. The problem is, I'm a sucker for hot girls. I tend to be blinded by their beauty. The result being, I don't always make the best decisions around them. But I had no idea what drama my weakness for a pretty girl was about to get me into. So it all began with the end-of-term college party. Me and my friends went heavy on the drinks. So when my friend Brad bet me a burger that I wouldn't go and ask Lisa to dance, well, I didn't hesitate in approaching her. Jeez, she's so hot and way out of my league. So I was expecting her to tell me to go away, but instead she smiled and let me lead her over to the dance floor. While we were dancing, she whispered in my ear that she'd always like me. Then, yep, you guessed it, Rosie, my crazy ex, stormed over and slapped me. I woke up the next morning with a pounding headache. Ugh, what was all that shouting coming from outside my open window? I wrapped my bed cover around me and shuffled my way over there to take a look. Huh, Lisa and Rosie were yelling at each other. He's mine, not yours. Stay away. He wants me, not you. Deal with it. Oh, yeah? Well, maybe we should ask Andrew who he prefers. What's the point? As we both know, he'll pick me. I was far too hungover for this, so I closed the window and went back to bed. These girls, uh, they wouldn't stop. For the next few days, they bombarded me with messages and waited for me outside my house. Okay, so most guys dream of two hot girls fighting over them, but trust me, watching them pull each other's hair extensions out isn't as glamorous as it sounds. Thankfully, my prayers were answered by none other than Richie, my awesome brother. He showed up with a ticket for a luxury two-week cruise trip. He'd booked it ages ago, but then a work thing came up, so the ticket was all mine. Hell yeah! I hugged my brother, grabbed the ticket out of his hand, and started packing. The tricky part was sneaking past Rosie and Lisa who were still lingering about outside. So I borrowed my housemate's hoodie and baseball cap and pretended to be him to get past them. Result? They didn't even double look at me. Goodbye to my Lisa and Rosie nightmare and hello to the vacation of my dreams. Ah, this is the life. Trust my brother to book such a lavish place. My room was huge and it had my very own balcony. There was so much to do here, from the outdoor bar, dozens of restaurants, swimming pool, cinema... I was on my own floating complex. Heaven. The next morning when I woke up in my king-size bed, I took in the sounds of silence. Yep. Oh, sweet silence, how I've missed you. This was a no-girl arguing zone. <laughs> I got changed and walked over to the outdoor bar. It definitely wasn't too early for a cocktail. 
I had a pair of shades on, and that's when I spotted her. Whoa, she was beautiful. I quickly ordered two cocktails and began walking toward her. I was about to hand her the drink when I tripped over a sun lounger, and in slow motion I watched the cup fall. I desperately tried to grab it, but nope. Instead, I managed to knock into her back. She let out a yelp and then yelled out, You pervert, what do you think you're playing at? I stood there open-mouthed, contemplating if I should dive into the pool to escape this drama or not. Then I looked down at my sunglasses, which in all the action had fallen off. Suddenly, an idea came to me. So I bent down, stretched out my arms, and pretended to fumble around for them. She looked at me for a while, then picked my sunglasses up, placed them in my hand, then said, Oh, I'm sorry, I I didn't realize. Here, let me help you. Then she took my arm and guided me across the pool area. I thanked her. And then, with my trusty shades on, I watched her walk away. So she thought I was blind. Yep, this wasn't my greatest idea, but it got me out of a sticky situation with a hot girl, at least. Later that night, I went to the buffet restaurant for dinner. I was stacking my plate when I bumped straight into someone and almost dropped my plate. Ugh, it was that odd girl again. I quickly put my shades on, then deliberately turned the wrong way and loudly said, Oh, I'm sorry. She put her hand on my shoulder and guided me so I was facing her, then said, Yeah, it's me, the girl from the pool. And it's okay, I should have been looking where I was going. Um, do you need any help? I quickly cut her off. No thanks, it's okay. Then I lifted my plate up to my nose and sniffed it. Mmm, these prawns sure smell good. She raised an eyebrow at my food-smelling talent, so I carried on pretending to sniff the food as I put it on my plate. And you know what? She wouldn't quit staring at me. Eventually, she walked off. Phew, what a narrow escape. Afterward, I went to the top deck bar to chill out. With yet another cocktail, then who should walk over, but yup, you guessed it, the hot girl. I immediately looked away from her, but what's this? She walked over to me and sat down opposite me. Hey, do you remember me? She asked. Seeing my chance to flirt with her, I replied. Oh yes, how could I forget someone as beautiful as you are? Huh? How do you know that I'm beautiful? Damn it, I needed to think before I spoke. Ah, well, it's your voice. A sweet voice like yours can only belong to a beautiful girl. Crisis averted. As after that, we started chatting, and oh boy, oh boy, she's a sweetheart. Do you know that she's an activist for an organization that works hard to guarantee the rights of baby girls born in Africa? I know, amazing. The evening came to an end, and she said, Oh, my name's Bella, by the way. I replied, Bella, a name as beautiful as your soul. Mine's Andrew. She gave me a nervous giggle. Well, Andrew, (laughs) it's getting late, so I suppose I better get back to my cabin. I didn't want the night to ever end, so I blurted out, Whoa, Bella, look at the sky. Isn't it so stunning? She glared at me and then replied, How would you know that? Oops. Of course, I was meant to be blind. Um, uh, I can feel it from the breeze. She gave me a quizzing look, then said, Right. Well, good night. How about we meet at the arcade tomorrow, let's say 10 a.m.? I excitedly agreed, then she left. Another close escape. I really needed to be more careful. Bella, Bella, Bella. I couldn't stop thinking of her. The next day, I'm such a kid when it comes to arcades, I can't help it. My inner child comes out and, ooh, a car racing game. Nope, I was pretending to be blind. So I awkwardly lingered in the foyer and waited for Bella to show up. When she did, she took my arm and guided me through the arcade. She described all the different games machines to me, which I thought was really sweet. Then she led me over to the plushy grabber machine and squealed excitedly. Hoo-hoo, I loved these as a kid. Soon, I was fumbling about to slot my money in, adamant I was going to win her a plushie. But wait, uh, I was meant to be blind. So I touched the controls, then closed my eyes. Her laughter said it all. Massive fail. It was all going to be okay, until Bella had to use the restroom, and instructed me to stay put and wait for her by a shooting game machine. Which so happened to be my all-time favorite arcade game. I rushed over to it as soon as she was out of sight, grabbed a gun, and shot five cans in a row. Then I jumped up and down and whooped in the air. I turned around and saw Bella frowning at me. Oh boy, busted. I tried to explain, but she just shook her head and said, How could you? You're a coward, a pervert, and a liar. Then she ran off. I felt terrible. I tried searching the ship for her, but I couldn't find her anywhere. Feeling bummed out, I ordered a cocktail, then went for a walk across the deck. Suddenly, I heard shouting coming from below me. Huh? What was that? I peered down and saw a man and a woman trying to drag a little girl into one of the safety rafts. Hang on, they weren't alone. Bella was there, too. She was trying to pull the little girl away from them. Without even thinking, I dropped my drink and ran over to them. I charged towards the woman and knocked her so hard she almost fell into the sea. The man reached out to steady her, 
which gave Bella a chance to pick up the kid. Then she grabbed my arm and pulled me away. After that, the bad guys jumped into the raft and sailed away. We returned the girl to her parents. It turns out Bella was on her way to her cabin when she saw a couple in tears as they couldn't find their daughter. So she went looking for her and walked in on the kidnapping. After that, Bella forgave me. Well, I did save the day and all. And we spent the rest of the trip together. Then on our last day, I got down on one knee and asked her to be my girlfriend. And she said yes. I took her back home with me. And as we walked over to my house, Lisa and Rosie ran towards me and started arguing with each other about who I liked more. Oh shoot, I'd forgotten about them. Reading the situation, Bella approached them. Thank God you're here. I assume one of you is his girlfriend, right? There was an accident, and Andrew's blind now, and he really needs someone by his side 24-7. Hearing that, I quickly coordinated with her by waving my arms wildly about. So, which one is your girlfriend, Andy? Uh, it's Lisa. Rosie quickly chimed in. No, uh, he's all yours. We only hung out once. Ha, <laughs> what suckers. I watched them run away. Then Bella and I burst out laughing. After that, I held my arm out to her and let her guide me home, you know, for old time's sake. Lying to her about being blind was a jerky thing to do, but I only did it in the first place because being around beautiful girls makes me so nervous I do dumb stuff. It's just lucky that Bella forgave me, because I think this dumbass may have found his dream girl. Hi, my name's Kat, which is short for Catherine, but only my mom calls me that. My dad's Indian, and my mom's American. They met back when he was working over here. Then they fell in love, got married, and had me. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, and they split up before I was born. In India, when you marry, it's meant to be for life. But still, my parents got divorced, so the reason for that must have been really serious. So serious that till this day, I still don't know. Every time I asked about it, my parents would just ignore me and change the subject. Anyway, I've always lived with my mom, but my dad lives close by. Most kids from broken homes hate not having both parents around all the time, but this never bothered me. Don't get me wrong, I love my dad and all, but I guess I couldn't miss what I didn't know. Besides, I had far bigger problems to deal with. Okay. So, don't laugh, hear me out. I'm a tomboy, a fact which my mom hates. Yep, I detest wearing skirts and dresses, or anything girly and sparkly. Yuck, give me basketball shorts and a baggy t-shirt any day. Also, I don't understand why some girls spend ages doing their makeup. Why would I want to make myself look like some living doll just to impress people? Please. I didn't get on that well with other girls. I guess I just had nothing in common with them. I didn't care about shopping and watching rom-coms. Nope. I'd much rather be kicking a ball around or playing video games. My best friend's a boy called Harry, and I've known him for, like, forever. He's the one who taught me how to ride a skateboard. Talk about an adrenaline buzz. Now I pretty much go everywhere on one. I'm like a real-life Bart Simpson. For my whole life, my mom's given me disapproving looks. From the time when I only invited boys to my sixth birthday party, tore the arms off the dolls she gave me, and point blank refused to move when she booked me in for ballet classes. I just wasn't a tea time with dolls and teddy bears kind of girl, and I didn't understand why she couldn't just buy me trucks and action figures instead. Then on top of that, mom only dressed me up in skirts and dresses. I had no option but to wear them and endure school feeling so uncomfortable. I mean, have you tried playing soccer in a frilly dress? Talk about ridiculous. The other boys always had to wait for me to straighten out my skirt or try and find the hairpins that kept tumbling out of my hair. I mean, seriously, those things were so lame. By the time I reached 12, I was done wearing girly clothes just to please my mom so I wore comfy, passed-down clothes that I got from my cousins beneath the hideous dresses and took them off en route to school. I was also so sick of my long, boring hair, so one day, I snuck into the barbers after school and got an undercut. Then one evening, I was chilling on the couch when Mom pointed at my hair and in a horrified voice said, Catherine, what have you done to yourself? I hadn't realized the way I was lying meant some of my undercut was on show. 
I just shrugged and replied, it's my hair, so I can do what I want with it. Why would you want to make yourself look ugly? She shouted. It's not ugly. It's cool. My mom looked so shocked. She grounded me for a month, and during that time, she barely spoke to me. The quarreling didn't end there. Over the next few years, it seemed like every little thing I did annoyed her. From chewing on gum to refusing to wear a dress to my cousin's wedding, you name it, it made her mad. On loads of occasions, she shouted at me that she wished I was normal. I didn't get it. My friends and teachers didn't treat me like I was an alien. So why did my mom? One time, when I was about to leave and go and skateboard with Harry, she actually accused me of being a lesbian. I just rolled my eyes at this. For the record, I'm not. I've had crushes on boys before. Anyway, my dad was a lot more chilled than mom. He's totally okay with me being a tomboy. One time, he even sent me a gift box with this really cool sports jersey and shorts in it. I stuck it in my wardrobe to hide it from mom, but she still managed to find it and threw it all in the trash. As I questioned her why she did that, she replied, If you want to live like a boy that much, you should move in with your dad. This made me so mad, so I packed a bag and went to dad's place. He was bugged out by what my mom had done, but still, he told me I should forgive her and that I couldn't live here for good with him as he couldn't be home all the time and take care of me like mom did. Yeah, right. More like he knew mom would never let this happen. It's like she hated me, but she still wanted me around so she had someone to moan at. I stayed with dad for a few days until he had to go on a business trip. Then I had to reluctantly go home, though I was still kind of sulky at my mom. Then came the bombshell as I just arrived home. Mom sat me down and told me that she was dating some new guy called Max. Wow. I knew mom and I weren't close but I had no idea she'd been dating some new dude. We're planning the wedding, and of course I want you to be my bridesmaid, but you'll have to wear a dress. What? She'd known the guy for five minutes, and now she was marrying him? Yeah, whatever, I replied. My mom looked surprised. That's all? You seriously have no problem with this? I got up and walked upstairs to my room while saying, Yeah, mom, I'm okay with it. I support you doing what you like, not like you who always scolds me for my preferences. I could sense my mom being flustered without looking back. Ha! I'd won this round. So, Max moved in with his teenage daughter, Taylor, who's a year younger than me and goes to the same school. Talk about a Barbie. All she seems to be is a mass of shiny blonde hair and pink everything. Seriously, her rucksack, bed covers, curtains, even her phone's pink. But it's fine. Everyone has their own taste, so, like, whatever. Actually, it turns out that this new addition to the family wasn't as bad as I thought. Max is an okay guy who never looks down on me or comments on my tomboy ways. And about my mom, her focus towards me decreased. I was basically invisible to her. Now she had Taylor around. You think I'd be mad jealous, huh? Actually, no. Not at all. I was glad of the peace. But then mom started comparing me to that brat, saying how I should be more like her as we were both girls, but I acted like a little demon. What? Taylor was so pathetic. She screamed when she saw a roach in the kitchen and refused to get down from the worktop until it had been removed. Don't even get me started on how she acted like she couldn't reach the top shelves in the school's library, so other boys had to help her. Ugh, sickening. Then things got heated when Taylor stormed into my room and asked me to come down for dinner. Well, I probably was playing my music too loudly to hear her knocking on my door. But still, she wasn't welcome here. Then she took a quick look around my room. Okay, I'm not exactly the most organized person, but I know exactly where things are. I asked her, what are you gopping at? Nothing, she bluffed. Hey. Why don't we go to the mall tomorrow? Let's go buy something cute. I need new clothes. And looks like you could use some help, too. I'm good, thanks. Crop tops aren't really my style. I'm not that much of a tryhard. I smirked at her. Oh, please. You wish you were like me. Look at yourself. You have the sense of fashion of a five-year-old boy. That's so childish. 
who wears cargo pants anymore. Beats being a flamboyant ugly duckling who hides behind a zillion layers of pink glitter and foundation. Well, at least this ugly duckling will soon become a swan. But you, you're stuck being a nobody forever. No wonder mom hates you. I stared at her with hatred. Who was she to judge me in my own house? I needed to teach this brat a lesson. I charged towards her and yanked back her hair. She yelled at me to stop. Then at that moment, my mother appeared and shouted at me. Catherine, stop this at once. You need to grow up. Me? I shouted back. She just told me you don't love me. Well, she has a point. No one could love someone who acts like this. Look in the mirror. Taylor only said what we're all thinking. You're 17 already, for God's sakes. Grow up a little and give me a break. What was mom saying? She was taking the side of some random girl that only just moved in over her actual daughter? Great. There's zero use fighting with these close-minded morons. I let go of Taylor and pushed her and my mom out of my room, screaming at them, Fine! You two go and live happily ever after in your pink, fake, girly world! Then I slammed the door in their dumb faces. I was so done with them. I was so done with everything! Hi everyone, I'm Amanda, and I'm 17 years old. This is a story about how I fell in love with my adoptive dad and the crazy things I discovered because of it. I need to be honest, as I've not had the easiest life, so when I fell in love with him, I probably wasn't thinking straight. My childhood was tough, as it was just me and my mom, and we lived in a slum in the city. My mom was pretty irritable, and she always took it out on me when she'd had too much to drink. I got used to it quickly, and hardly even cried when she did this. I just thought it was normal to be treated like this. But when I was seven, my mom got arrested for fraud and drug use, and she got sentenced to ten years in prison. I'll never forget the moment the police broke our door down and took my mom away. It was late at night, and I just screamed and cried. All I had was my mom. Without her, I was nobody. Even though she hurt me when she was drunk, she was still my mom, and I loved her so much, and she loved me too. After she was taken away, and the police said I wouldn't see her for a while, social services placed me in an orphanage. Life there was even worse than in the slum with my mom, but I told myself it was only 10 years, and that as soon as my mom was released from prison, she'd come get me, and that by then, she'd have changed and wouldn't hit me anymore. But that's not what happened. After one year, an old couple came to adopt me. They'd been trying to have a baby for years with no luck. I thought maybe this was my chance to finally have a loving home. They cried with happiness when they saw me, but the minute we got back to their house, everything went downhill. They were both quite old and strict, and immediately sat me down and went over their set of rules. It was torture. Anytime I did one thing wrong, like accidentally breaking a glass or spilling some soy sauce on the table, they'd punish me by starving me for the whole day, until I almost fainted. After three months of this, they took me back to the orphanage and complained that I was a spoiled little brat with no manners. To be honest though, I was relieved. They were old and grumpy, and we clearly weren't well suited. Years passed by, and when I was 12, I was adopted by another family who ran a small restaurant. I stupidly thought it would be better this time, and at first it was, but pretty soon they started making me help out in the restaurant, doing all their chores and even the housework at home. I very quickly realized they'd basically just adopted me so I could be their maid. But there was one nice thing about this family, their son. His name was Jose and he was two years older than me. Unlike his parents, he was actually super kind. He would often steal food from me from the kitchen and even helped me finish the chores. But one time, his mom saw Jose helping me and thought I'd forced him into it. She was so angry at me, she took me straight back to the orphanage. I couldn't believe it. After four years, they just sent me back. After those two disastrous attempts at being adopted, I thought I'd never find a family who actually wanted me. I pretty much gave up all hope and resigned myself to the fact that I just have to endure the orphanage life until my mom got let out of prison. But then, one day, a man named James came to the orphanage to volunteer, and that's when my life changed. He looked quite young. 
around 40 or so, and he had a kind smile. Often, I'd catch him looking at me, and it made me feel quite shy. No one had ever paid me attention like this before, not even my mom. Then one day, the women who worked at the orphanage took me aside and told me that James wanted to adopt me. I told them I wasn't interested, and then I went to my room. Honestly, I was sick and tired of these foster families who just used me. I didn't want to go through that again. The next day, I was sitting on the swing in the garden of the orphanage when James came over. I got up off the swing and was about to leave when he asked if we could sit and talk a little bit. I was really hesitant, but he had such a kind face and I felt bad being rude. He then showed me a photo of a woman and a child, and I couldn't believe how much the child looked like me when I was younger. He told me that they were his wife and his daughter, but that they had died in a car accident eight months ago, and that he still couldn't get over the loss. So he'd been coming to the orphanage to volunteer, and now he felt ready to adopt someone. Then he looked at me and said, As soon as I saw you, Amanda, I knew you were the one I wanted to adopt. I didn't know what to say. I felt so sorry for him, and I knew what it felt like to experience loss. So I told him I'd be happy if he wanted to adopt me. He was so excited, and the very next day, he came to pick me up and take me to my new home. I was quite nervous, but as soon as I saw how cozy the house was, covered in family photos, and with a nice bedroom for me, I knew I'd made the right decision. James was the perfect adoptive dad. He was polite and kind and always listened to me. He didn't make me do chores, and he didn't create a strict set of rules for me to follow. With him, I could just be myself, and for the first time in years, I was happy. He made me laugh so much. Finally, life was good. But there was just one little problem. You see, I was a teenage girl, and the more time I spent with James, the more I started to think I liked him in a way that wasn't appropriate for a relationship between an adoptive dad and his daughter. One night, he was getting out of the shower, and he'd left the door open. I saw him standing there, wearing a towel around his waist, and I couldn't take my eyes off him. I knew it was wrong to be looking, but I just couldn't stop. Then one day, he was doing some gardening, and he hurt his back. I offered to give him a massage, and he was so grateful. As I rubbed his back with oil, he said to me, Oh, Amanda, your hands are so soft. I haven't felt so comfortable in a long time. I was glad he couldn't see my face, because I was blushing like crazy. Afterwards, he offered to give me a foot massage, but I said no because I didn't think I'd be able to handle it. I liked him so much, and that night, I went to bed wondering if he liked me too. And then one night, he asked if he could read me a bedtime story. Even though I was 16, he said he'd always read to his daughter and he missed it. So I said sure he could. And then, you won't believe it, he fell asleep next to me, in my bed. I barely slept a wink that night. I just watched him as he slept and had to stop myself from reaching out to stroke his hair. I so badly wanted to tell him how I felt. But for now, this was enough. Just being close to him and getting to have a peaceful life together. Little did I know that our peace was about to be disrupted. A woman moved in next door to us. Her name was Rosa, and she was seriously gorgeous. After she'd unpacked, we went over to say hi, and straight away, I regretted it. She immediately started flirting with James, even reaching out and stroking his arm as she said, Oh my, look at those muscles. I'll need your help setting up my kitchen, if you don't mind. James just laughed and said he'd be happy to help. As we walked away, I looked back and saw Rosa checking out James, and I knew she was going to be trouble. And sure enough, after that first meeting, she kept popping up. The next day, she asked James to help her fix a light bulb, and then a few days later, she came over with a plate of muffins to thank him. She never really spoke to me. She only had eyes for James, and I didn't like it one bit. Was she trying to steal him from me? The more she hung around, the more jealous I became. Everything had been perfect until she turned up, and now I was so scared James would fall for her and I'd be all alone again. My feelings were becoming so intense, so I decided there was only one thing for it. I had to tell him how I felt. I was pretty sure he had feelings for me too. I had to act quick, before Rosa made a move. Hi, it's me again, Diane. In part two of my story, I started to work in my parents' company. 
but I didn't have the courage to tell them the truth that I was their long-lost daughter. Fortunately, one day, I found out that Brett, my boyfriend, wasn't my half-brother, and that his mom, Ashley, had been lying this whole time. But I didn't want to unveil the truth because I didn't want Brett to get hurt. That was until the day I bumped into Ashley. In the store, I watched as she looked at the photo of me and my mom and aunt from when I was just a baby, and the look of recognition on her face as she realized my aunt was the kidnapper she hired nearly 20 years ago. She looked at me terrified. Are, are, are you that baby? Are, are you also the one I saw in the company earlier this afternoon? What are you doing with Brett and his dad there? Did you, did you know everything? She shot questions at me and didn't even wait for my response. Instead, she just started yelling at me, claiming that I was plotting to get revenge on her for stealing my life away from me. I knew it was pointless trying to explain to her, so I said nothing and watched as she ran out of the store without buying anything. The next day when I got to the company, I found out that Brett had suddenly disappeared. He hadn't come to work, and no one could get in touch with him. My dad told me that he'd gone to see his mom the night before, and after that he hadn't come home. Oh my god, his mom! After he'd bump into me, had she done something bad to him? I couldn't bear it. My aunt had given me Ashley's address, so I went there to find out what was going on. As soon as she opened the door, I asked her where Brett was. And she just smirked at me and said she told him I was his half-sister and that I was preparing to kick him out of my dad's family. So she said he must have run away because he was so disgusted by me. I felt so angry I wanted to scream. Ashley was ruining everything. She even said to me, you can't fool me. It's no coincidence that you're working in your dad's company and that you've seduced Brett. You're doing all of this on purpose. Well, that just made me even angrier. I said to her, I know Brett isn't my dad's son. I did a DNA test, and you're lucky I haven't said anything to either of them. But I will now. You better prepare yourself for the consequences. Then I left, leaving her standing there looking angry. I went straight to my parents' house to tell them before Ashley could beat me there to tell them lies. They let me in straight away and asked me what was going on and if it was about Brett. I nodded and took out all the evidence I'd prepared. This was the moment of truth. I was so nervous. I gave them the DNA results of Brett and my dad, then the baby photo of me, and then a letter my aunt had written confessing about how Ashley had hired her to kidnap me. My parents were shocked, of course, and had a lot of questions, but soon it all became clear and we all started crying. It was just so overwhelming. I even told them about what Ashley had told Brett the night before and begged them to believe me that I didn't do it all on purpose. Of course they said they believed me, and I was relieved. But the very next day, you won't believe what Ashley told them. My parents went straight to Ashley's the next day to confront her, and she couldn't deny it because there was so much evidence. But then she told my parents that she had been feeling so guilty... So she was the one who'd gotten in touch with my aunt and encouraged her to tell me the truth and then help me find my parents. After my parents told me this, I told them Ashley was lying. She was trying to make herself look like an angel when she was none other than the devil. I suggested to my parents we sue her or something, and then a few days later Ashley got in touch with me. She'd found out where I lived, and as soon as I let her in, she begged me not to sue her. She'd obviously already received a warning letter from my parents' lawyer. She said she had a family to care for and didn't want them to know about her past. Then she promised me she'd never come near me or my family again. I was sick of her now and asked her to leave. But then she apologized again and she really regretted everything she told Brett and that she'd gone to see him. What? Where did you find him? I asked. And she told me that she found him at her parents' house, where she and Brett had lived when he was little before she'd gotten married. Oh, that's right. I knew Brett loved his grandparents so much and often visited them. I hadn't even thought that that was where he could be. Then she told me that Brett hadn't disappeared because he was disgusted by me. It was because he felt so guilty about everything that had happened. She told me she'd already gone to see him and confessed because she wanted to at least be seen as an honest mother in her son's eyes. 
After I told Brett that he isn't your dad's son, he got so angry and shouted at me that he hated me and never wanted to see me again. It crushed me. Ashley told me and started to cry. Please forgive me, Diane, she continued. I've lost Brett. Surely that's punishment enough for everything I've done? I thought that what I did would help Brett so he could grow up in a wealthy family. But turns out all I did was hurt the people around me, especially Brett. Can you guess what I did next? I went to meet my parents and asked them to remove all accusations against Ashley. You're probably wondering why I changed my tune so quickly. Well, I felt like enough revenge had already happened, and I couldn't bear anyone suffering anymore. All I'd ever wanted was to have a peaceful life, and revenge only satisfies us for a second. It doesn't make us happy in the long term. After that, Ashley came to apologize to my parents, and swore she'd completely disappear from our life after that. Then she gave us Brett's grandparents' address, and asked us not to put any blame on Brett. Then she left. Poor Brett. When I went to meet him, it was clear he was the one who'd been hurt most by all of this. His grandparents told me that after Ashley had revealed the truth to him, he'd lock himself up in his room and hadn't come out. I knocked on his door and begged him to let me in. After a while, he opened the door, and I couldn't believe how he looked. He'd become so skinny, and his eyes were so sad. It made me so upset to see him like this. He said to me that he blamed himself for everything. For the big lie my life had been, for my parents' loss of their only child, and for the way we'd broken up. He truly believed all of this was because of him and his mom. I hugged him and told him none of this was his fault, and I asked him to come back to my parents' house because we all missed him so much. He eventually agreed, but I could see he was nervous, especially when both my parents knew that Brett wasn't related to them by blood. But my parents welcomed him back into the house. However, I could see they were feeling a bit awkward about what to say. So I stood up and said to them, Even though you guys aren't actually related, you've still been so happy together. Just like my adoptive mom, she ended up getting a daughter she might never have had. And you got a son that brought you so much joy. Sure, there were lots of lies, but we were still happy, right? Believe it or not, everything worked out after that. Brett and I went back to school, and we've both decided to go work at my parents' company after graduation. I have chosen to move in with my parents, but of course, I still visit my adoptive mom and aunt all the time. My adoptive mom understands that this is important for me, so that I can get to know my parents properly and catch up on lost time. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. I asked my parents to forgive my adoptive mom and aunt, because even though they acted wrongly in the past, they still raised me and did such an amazing job. As for Brett, he moved out into his own place, but still visits my parents all the time. However, Brett and I are no longer dating. It wasn't because of my parents, though. Let's be honest, it would just be too weird if we kept dating after everything we'd been through. It was a hard decision for us both, but it's for the best. We both need to move on so that we can have a better future. And hey, at least we can still be friends, and soon, colleagues too. Have you ever questioned if your teacher hates you? I wish I didn't have to, but yep, my teacher hated my guts, and she went out of her way to make it very clear. I'm Lori, by the way. I'm 15 years old, and I guess you could say I kind of stand out because of my looks. People say I'm kind of pretty. Anyway, this year I started high school, although I only joined halfway through the year because I was off sick for six months with glandular fever. Yep, I had the dreaded mono. I was so tired of lying in bed feeling sorry for myself, so when the doctor said I could finally go back to school, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was in store for me. On my first day, I had to show all my teachers my hospital certificate to explain why I'd missed so much of the year. When I gave it to Miss Atkin, my math teacher, she smiled and said, Welcome. Nice to see you feeling so much better. I smiled back at her and said, Thank you. And I was about to walk away when suddenly she said, Excuse me, you're Lori Hannison? Her face looked all weird, and when I told her, Yep, that was me, Something inside her changed. She gave me a cold stare and told me to go to my seat immediately. I was confused a little bit about her attitude, but then I moved on from it. The most important thing was how I could catch up with my class. After missing six months of math, I was super behind and couldn't understand anything. My mom had to hire a tutor for me, and he was such a good teacher. 
Only after three months, I finally caught up with them. I had a notebook from our sessions with lots of notes inside, and whenever I couldn't remember something, I'd just look at it. Well, one day, I had it on my desk at school, and Miss Atkin caught me seeing my notes. She marched towards me, grabbed it, and slammed it down in front of me. She was so angry and got right up in my face and said, Never, ever bring another teacher's notes to my class. Do you hear me? As she said that, a little bit of spit flew out of her mouth and landed on my nose. I was horrified. Why was she so angry at me? It kind of scared me, and I thought maybe she was just angry because I wasn't as good at math as everyone else. After that, I didn't dare bring my notebook to class. But sometimes I still struggled, so I'd ask my friend who sat nearby to help me. Miss Atkin always caught me asking her and would put me in detention. One time I just sneezed too loud and she gave me detention. I mean, can you even believe? It annoyed me so much that I started to rebel. I'd often fall asleep in her class and I seriously lost all motivation to do well. And that's not all. One day I wore a new dress to class and I swear I looked exactly like all the other girls at school. But Miss Atkin publicly embarrassed me by making me stand up in front of everyone, then said, Girls and boys, Lori is a fine example of someone who pays more attention to what she wears than to studying. Don't be like Lori. I could feel myself blushing and I wanted to cry. She was deliberately being mean to me and I had no idea why. I was not that kind of girl. I normally loved studying, and I didn't care about clothes and shoes at all. I couldn't say anything, though, because if I spoke back to her, she'd give me a worse grade. What made it all even worse was that she was also the cheerleading coach, and she had her pack of cheerleaders following her around everywhere. One time I was standing in the hall talking with my friend Joe. We'd been best friends since we were like three years old, and we also live in the same street, so we'd grown up together. Joe always had my back. So we were standing there chatting when Miss Atkin and some of her fave students walked by. Suddenly, I heard one of the girls say, Oh, look, surprise, surprise. It's Lori flirting with a boy again. Then one of the other girls said, Seriously, she's such a fake. I mean, she's using her illness to get attention from boys. How pathetic. I couldn't believe it. Did they think I was deaf or something? They were the ones who were fake with their thick layers of makeup and all of their gossip and drama. I didn't really care that they were saying these things, but what really got to me was the way Miss Atkin laughed along with them. I actually saw her nod her head, so she agreed with them. I knew that wasn't okay, and Joe saw it too. He was so angry and grabbed my hand and said we had to report her to the principal. I stopped him though and said, just leave it. I am still the new girl here, and I don't want to cause any drama. And anyway, I have a plan. I smirked at him as I said this. So, Miss Atkin has this policy where if someone's phone rings in class, they have to answer it on speakerphone. And that policy includes her, too. So that day, I pretended to bump into her as she entered the class and watched as her phone dropped out of her hands. I quickly picked it up and apologized for being so clumsy. But at the same time, I unmuted it when she wasn't looking. Easy peasy. You see, I'd arranged for Joe to call her. This was going to be hilarious. Sure enough, five minutes later, her phone started ringing loudly. Her ringtone was Beyonce's single ladies, and everyone burst out laughing. She freaked out and quickly grabbed her phone to cancel it. But Joe was persistent. He just kept calling, and everyone in class reminded her of the policy, so she had no choice but to answer it. Well, just wait for this. She answered, and suddenly Joe's voice filled the room. But he'd put on a funny accent to make himself sound older. Honey, don't forget about our secret date at our favorite hotel tonight. Miss Atkin looked like she wanted to die. She said, who is this? I don't know you. Then Joe said, come on, baby, what's up? Is your husband there? Miss Atkin was now visibly shaking and said, you've got the wrong number. But Joe wouldn't stop. Ah, uh, you're so cute. I'll see you tonight, baby. Get ready for a fun night, wink wink. At that, Miss Atkin hung up and the whole class was just deathly silent. I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from laughing. Joe had really outdone himself. However, I hadn't exactly thought it all through. Because a couple of days later, Joe and I were about to walk home when he got called into the principal's office. 
I went with him, but they wouldn't let me in. I could see Miss Atkin in the room along with the principal and Joe. She'd somehow found out that it was Joe who'd called her, and now the principal said that Joe would be expelled and that his parents would need to come in for a meeting the following day. Oh my god, this was all my fault. When he came out, I rushed over and started apologizing, but Joe said, Don't worry, I did it, so I'll take the responsibility. I was beside myself with guilt. I just kept saying, Joe, no, this is my fault. I'm the one who should be expelled. But Joe wouldn't even listen to me. Well, that evening, I told my parents the whole story. I was crying as I told them, and obviously they were angry, but they were also supportive. The next day, Joe's parents came for their meeting. The principal was there, and the school board, and of course, Miss Atkin. Luckily, my parents arrived just in time to interrupt the meeting, and we burst into the room. We told them the truth, how I'd been so ill and had to get a tutor, and that's why I carry that notebook. Then how Miss Atkin had treated me so badly and been so rude to me the whole time. I told them the phone call incident had been my fault and that Joe had just wanted to help me. Suddenly, Miss Atkin stood up and pointed at me and said, I knew it was you. You spoiled brat. You should be expelled. What happened next was crazy. My mom jumped up and said, how dare you speak to my daughter like that? You hate her because she's my daughter. Get over it, Angela. It's been years. Well, Miss Atkin ran towards my mom and said, you're a horrible woman. And so is your daughter. You deserve each other. She was about to grab my mom, but my dad jumped up and stopped her. I didn't understand what was happening. Everyone was so shocked. The principal looked so puzzled. Then he told us all to go home and calm down. When we got home, my mom sat me down and said, If you're being mistreated, you need to tell us. Don't suffer it out alone, okay? I told my mom I was fine and that school was great. But then my dad interrupted and said, You're fine? Don't lie to us. You were almost expelled. Then my mom said, Honey, calm down. It's not her fault. You saw her teacher. She's a demon. Then my dad just laughed and... I was so confused. Then he said, Oh yeah, Lori, we should have told you this already, but Miss Atkin was at school with us. Then they told me how the three of them had gone to high school together, and both my mom and Miss Atkin had a crush on my dad, so they became sworn enemies. They fought all the time, and Miss Atkin had been expelled from school because of my mom. Of course, my dad hadn't known all of that back then, and he'd fallen in love with my mom. Wow, now I understand the real reason Miss Atkin treated me like that. She was obviously still angry at my mom, and when she'd seen my name, she hadn't been able to control her anger anymore, and she'd just released it all on me. My mom said, Lori, you look exactly like me in high school. Because I was pretty, so many people were jealous. (laughs) Then she turned to my dad, smiled, and said, I can see that Joe is quite similar to your dad. You should be careful. At that, mom and I burst out laughing. My dad was just speechless. And guess what? It all worked out in the end. Miss Atkin got reassigned to another school, and Joe and I were only suspended from school for two weeks. Now we're closer than ever, and there's definitely some real chemistry between us. Finally, high school is getting good again, huh? Hey, Kat here again. Are you ready for the next part of my story? If you haven't seen the first two parts, then what are you doing? Go and watch them right now. But if you have seen them, do you remember what happened to me? I'm a tomboy, a fact which my mom hates. Then her fiancé Max moved in with his girly daughter Taylor, and mom clearly favored her over me. If this wasn't enough to deal with, I was then in an embarrassing situation at the mall while trying to be girly to impress this cute guy called Garrett who's into girly girls. So, after the rescue of my best friend Harry, and some help getting ready from my mom, I arranged to meet Garrett at the coffee shop, so I could tell him exactly how I felt about him before his soccer team party. As I walked up the street to meet Garrett, I felt so happy. I'm sure it would be a surprise for him to see me dressed all girly, and he'd be into it. Then we'd kiss. Wow, that sounds great! I was the first one there, so I grabbed a hot chocolate and waited. Jeez. That five-minute wait felt like five years. Then he strolled through the door looking so casual but cute. He looked me up and down and then said, Um, Kat, you do know the party later is just a casual hangout? I kept my cool as I replied, Oh, this old dress? It's just something I threw on in a hurry. 
He ordered a drink, and we talked for a bit. I knew it was the only chance, either now or never, so I just came out with it. Look, Garrett, I think you're cool. Really cool, in fact. I have a crush on you. No, I think I like you a lot. He looked a little flustered, but surely this was totally normal, as he was just digesting my words, right? After a few minutes of silence, he gave me an awkward look as he said, Cat, I think you're great, but you're not my type. I just see you as one of the boys. I'm not his type? And he just sees me as a boy? I sat there completely heartbroken. Each word he said felt like a sharp knife stabbing into my little heart. I immediately stood up and asked him, What? You don't think I'm a girl? I'm in a dress, for goodness sake. If I'm not girly enough for you, then who is? He seemed a bit confused by my question, then reluctantly replied, Um, I'm into gentle girls. Who need me to protect? Um, like Taylor, for example. She's your sister, right? Could you help me and Taylor become a couple? What? Not only did he have the cheek to publicly reject me, but now he was admitting to me that he liked that Barbie doll? I yelled at him. You have to be kidding me. Out of all the girls in the world, you like Taylor? Then I stormed out of there, relieved that I'd worn ballet pumps over evil high heels. I arrived home to the smell of freshly baked scones. Then I saw my mom and Taylor baking together in the kitchen. I wasn't in the mood for cooking with Barbie hour, so I slammed the door shut and stomped up to my room. My mom appeared and shouted up the stairs to me, Hey, honey, how was your date? Why are you back so early? Seriously, it was pretty clear from my door slamming that it hadn't gone well. Why did she feel the need to humiliate me in front of Taylor, of all people? Get real, mom. I'm clearly upset. But then, what do you know? You only care about your shiny new daughter, Taylor. I ran into my room to change out of that damn dress I was wearing. Then I threw it down the stairs at her and yelled out, It's your dress, so take it back, and play dress-ups with her instead. My mom looked hurt, and at first, I felt a little bad. But then she shouted back, Why can't you just act like a normal girl and grow up? If you stopped being so selfish and made an effort with your appearance, your date might have gone better. Then Taylor continued, Don't be too much for mom. She means well. If that boy doesn't like you, then that's your issue, not hers. What the hell? How dare this nobody blame me? And why was she calling my mom, mom? I didn't call Max dad. Ugh, she was the worst person in the world. I hated her. I wanted her to go back to Barbie land and never come back. I stormed out of the house and took the bus to my dad's house. I tried to hold back my emotions so that I wouldn't burst into tears, but honestly, I had nothing. Garrett had brutally rejected me in favor of Taylor. I was still in a mood with Harry, and Mum had made it clear I was an embarrassment to her. The worst part was Harry had been right. I had lost myself. I was not myself anymore. I showed up at Dad's, and as soon as he opened the door, I burst into tears and hugged him. I told him everything and begged him to let me live with him. Dad tried to analyze everything for me. After a while, I calmed down and realized that, okay, maybe I was a bit sassy with mom. Then dad said, actually, Kat, there's something I wanted to tell you. I really still love your mom and want you to help me get back with her. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that, but I was totally down for helping him. Goodbye to Barbie Taylor and hello to a proper family. Dad allowed me to stay for the night to let the tension between mom and me calm down. His apartment was on the small side, so I had to sleep on the couch. But I didn't mind, as it meant I could stay up watching movies all night without mom moaning at me that I needed my beauty sleep. I arrived home the next day to mom and Max cleaning the house together. They were laughing and joking around and, yeah, okay, they looked really happy together. But dad deserved this happiness more, right? I greeted both of them, but only Max replied. My mother ignored me like I was invisible. She must have still been mad at me. So all this tension wasn't a part of my get dad back with mom plan. So before I left for school, I walked up to mom, 
said sorry, then kissed her on the cheek. Cheesy, but worth it. Then, as I was rummaging through my locker at school, I felt someone pat me on the shoulder. I turned around to see that it was Harry. Cat, I'm sorry, he said. I turned around and continued to look through my locker. I'd forgiven him already, but I wanted to make him sweat a bit first. Come on, Cat. I won't be able to study if I know you're mad at me, and my grades will suffer. I laughed and said, Take me out for ice cream after school, and I may consider forgiving you. I think I can manage that. He smiled at me. After school, we went to the ice cream shop nearby. My mood was so good, and I told Harry all about my plan to get Dad back with Mom. He wasn't so sure about it, but regardless of this, he promised to have my back. So, I had an ally. And the plan to heal my parents' feelings officially began. First, I invited Dad over for dinner. Mom wasn't overly impressed, but she couldn't say no. After all, he was my dad. During the meal, I went on about past stories, such as the time we all went on vacation together for my seventh birthday, and Dad lost his swimming trunks in the sea. My parents and Max just laughed, but I could make out the annoyed look on Taylor's face. After the meal, we watched TV together, and Taylor volunteered to make drinks for everyone. Then she brought out five glasses of orange juice. Dad took a large sip of his, then immediately spit it out all over his clothes and rushed to the toilet. Turns out, she'd put mustard in my dad's glass, but neither Max nor Mom said anything about it. Damn little Taylor. Then one night, when I knew that Mom and Max were going on a private date, I deliberately hid Max's key. By the time they found them in the plant pot two hours later, they'd missed their time slot. Talk about success. Another day, my mom suggested going on a picnic, so I immediately called Harry and my dad and invited them to join. Then, while we were in the park waiting for Harry to show up, I saw Garrett walking over, hand in hand, with Taylor. Talk about awkward. Garrett couldn't even meet my eye, and I just wanted the ground to swallow me up. Mom asked them how long they'd been together. She said two weeks, so I did the math. O-M-G. That meant they got together on the day I confessed my feelings towards him. Whatever. I was so over Garrett. Although I have to admit, I was relieved when I saw Harry walking over with a basket full of my favorite foods. Taylor kept asking Garrett to feed her. Ew. It was so awkward. When Harry saw me staring at the couple with bullet-like eyes, he so quickly passed me a slice of chocolate cake. A while later, I asked Harry to help me take some photos. Then I quickly dragged Dad and Mom to take family pictures. I could see Dad was enjoying standing next to her, and I heard him tell her that she looked beautiful. Good one, Dad. Only Taylor wasn't having any of it. She immediately led Max over and pushed me out of the way so he could stand next to Mom. I stood next to Taylor, and before Harry counted to three, I flipped Taylor's hair and deliberately stood over her. She glared at me. But I'm on top of the world, sucker. Anyway, I felt so good after that picnic, and I even thought that the day when Dad returned home would be soon. But a few days later during dinner, Mom and Max went on about what starters they wanted at their wedding. What? She still wanted to marry Max? So what about my dad? I immediately showed my annoyance, skipped my half-eaten meal, and stormed up to my room. I sat in my room, looked back at the picnic photos, and thought about my next plan. Then, I heard a knock on the door. It was Max. Cat, I have something important to tell you, he said with a sad voice. Uh-oh, this couldn't be good, could it? Hey, it's me, Cat. I'm back to fill you in on the next part of my drama-filled life. So... Me and my mom have never got on that well. She hates my tomboy ways and wishes I was a girl. So when her new fiancé Max moved in with his Barbie doll daughter Taylor, well, my mom instantly loved her more than me. During an argument, she even told me that she couldn't love someone like me and that I should grow up. How could my mom say that to my face? And especially in front of that little brat Taylor! I was so angry that I shut myself in my room that night and skipped dinner. But then, around 3 a.m., my stomach wouldn't quit growling, so I snuck down to the kitchen, and surprise, surprise, 
There was no leftover food for me at all. Great. Clearly, they didn't view me as a part of this family anymore and wanted me to starve to death. I couldn't fall back asleep after that. So as soon as the sun came up, I called my best friend Harry up early. He answered the phone half asleep. What? I told him to rise and shine as I needed saving from my nightmare of a home life. Oh, and I also told him to bring food. He muttered out a, yeah, fine. At least leaving early meant I wouldn't have to face Mom and Taylor. As soon as I got into Harry's car, he threw me a sandwich and asked what was wrong. And I told him how Taylor's basically nightmare Barbie. He grinned at me. Yeah? What did she do? Steal all your food? Trust him to make a joke out of my distress. Anyways, I told him everything that had happened while munching on the sandwich. He replied, Come on, cat. Like you're gonna let some 16-year-old get the better of you? How about I come over after school and suss out the situation? I'll fight off this kid for you. I jokingly replied, Okay. I guess that might help keep the peace, as for some reason, my mom seems to like you. So, Harry came round, and naturally, my mom was all over him, telling him how handsome he is and demanding he stay for dinner. Talk about cringe! Then I had to listen to mom telling him how she didn't understand me, and how he should talk some sense into me. Er, hello? I was still in the room. Then Taylor arrived home all shiny-haired and girly. I swear my mom's face lit up just by seeing her. And worse still, so did Harry's. Ugh! Oh, Harry, have you met Taylor? Cat's sister. She goes to the same school as you guys. Hi, Taylor. I've definitely seen you around, but I didn't know you were Cat's sister. She wouldn't tell me. He elbowed me while being all smiley to her. In that whiny voice of hers, Taylor replied, Nice to meet you, Harry. Are you Cat's boyfriend? We all burst out laughing. Then my mom chimed in. Honey, I wish, but no. Your sister seems to be allergic to love. But you two would make a lovely couple. What on earth? They both laughed and Harry replied, I'd love to, but such a pretty girl like Taylor wouldn't lay an eye on me. Great. Thanks, Harry. As if Taylor isn't big-headed enough. I slyly kicked Harry's leg and gave him a dirty look. After dinner, me and Harry went to play video games in my room. As soon as I closed the door, he told me that Taylor seemed all right. Was he blinded by her Barbie looks or something? I was so mad that I slammed down my game's controller and told him he sucked. Ugh! Why did everyone treat me like such a joke? So, what if I didn't dress up girly? I still had feelings. They knew nothing about me. I actually had a huge crush on this boy at school called Garrett. He was on the boys' soccer team, and he was so talented. I totally swooned out loud when he scored three goals in a row. I usually didn't like jocks. As a member of the girls' soccer team, our teams often trained together, and I had to put up with them showing off to impress girls, while in reality, they couldn't actually play, and they skipped practice all the time to go partying. Garrett was different. He totally shined amongst those useless guys. I took the initiative to talk to him. Turns out, Garrett and I had loads in common. We instantly clicked and talked nonstop about soccer, skateboarding, and other stuff. Okay, so there was one problem. He seemed to be interested in the cheerleader type of girl once he even admitted his celebrity crush was Selena Gomez. Yeah, I know. She's as girly as you can get. That got me thinking a lot. I definitely wouldn't change who I was, but maybe a little makeover wouldn't hurt, right? I told Harry about it, and he just told me it was stupid, and he wasn't really supportive, which was strange for him, but whatever. So Harry worked evenings and weekends at the burger joint in the mall. I knew it was just so he could check out the girls going into the clothes shop opposite. I knew if I was going to win Garrett's heart, then I'd need to change my style, so I started visiting Harry more often at work. I'd sit there munching on free fries while watching the girly girls shop so I could get the gist of the in trends and stuff. Then I stole my mom's lip gloss and some glittery eyeshadow and put it on for school. I even started wearing this plaid purple skirt mom bought for me. I mean, at least it was sort of edgy, right? Though I had nothing other than my collection of oversized tees to go with it, but whatever, it was girly enough. O. M. G. Wearing a skirt is hard work. 
I couldn't run as fast or jump up to grab something off the top shelf. I also kept on forgetting I was wearing a skirt and sitting with my legs apart. Oops. My plan was working, though, as Garrett started sitting with me and Harry at lunch. Oh, and one time when I was struggling to run in a skirt, he passed me his jacket to tie around my waist. It gets even better. He invited me to his soccer team party. OMG! Talk about hitting the jackpot. This meant he liked me, right? That was it. I decided that the party will be my grand finale. I'd get a total makeover and confess my feelings to him while there. Finally, the day of the party arrived, so I put my awesome plan into action. Okay, so mom's lousy makeup just wasn't cutting it, so I went into the drugstore and used up the testers. I even packed a pair of mom's high heels with me. Now all I needed was a dress. Obviously, I wasn't going to buy one for keeps. No, I'd wear them for the party and return it the next day. All of my spying taught me one thing. Floral print was the in thing right now. So I bought this flowy floral dress in my size and went to the mall restrooms to try it on, so I had more privacy. I put the high heels on and zipped up the dress, but it seemed a little tight. Jeez, talk about tiring. I could barely reach the zipper on my back. After, like, five minutes of struggling, I was impatient and used up all of my force to pull it up. Done. Finally. But, uh uh-oh. My hair was stuck in between the zipper. Ugh, stupid long hair. I began to panic. I was completely stuck. Harry was on shift in the burger joint, so I sent him an emergency message. He sent me five crying with laughter emojis back, but he also said he'd be straight over. I couldn't expect him to come into the girls' restrooms, so I had to try and walk out into the mall foyer. My hair was stuck, so I had my face up to the sky and every step was shaky due to the high heels. My two arms went straight out to navigate since I couldn't properly see the way. I must have looked like a zombie. People were whispering and laughing. It flustered me, and I tripped. The laughters were even louder now, and I couldn't even get up. I laid there in a weird position, feeling so helpless as anger and embarrassment filled me up. Thank God I heard a familiar voice. Cat, are you okay? Harry to the rescue. Finally, he shooed everyone away, took the heels off my feet, and helped me get up. Then he said, Oh my god, Cat, what have you done? Seriously, why are you making a fool of yourself just because of some jock? You've lost yourself, Cat. He kept on grumbling as he tried to fix the zipper. Great, as if I wasn't already miserable enough. He was treating me just like my mom did. I was so angry, I pushed him out of my way as soon as he was done with the zipper, then stomped off. I was so mad. I washed all of the makeup off my face, changed back to my normal clothes, and went home. No more party or whatever. I was done. As soon as I reached home, I ran straight to my room and saw a brand new dress on my bed. What? I never wanted to see one of those evil things again. I grabbed the dress and stormed downstairs and started screaming at mom. I won't wear this. I hate it. I will never be like Little Miss Perfect Taylor, so please stop. I expected mom to yell back, but to my surprise, she didn't. She told me that Harry had messaged her telling her what had happened. Oh my god, Harry, you snitch. I pulled out my phone and was about to dial the number to yell at him. Mom stopped me and continued. He's worried about you, honey, so he asked me to help you out. I saw this dress in a shop the other day and bought it for you to wear to my wedding, but I think today is a special occasion too. Put it on, and go tell that boy you like him. Mom hugged me. Wow, talk about an emotional roller coaster. I was so touched and embarrassed about my thoughts and actions, so I agreed to let mom help me curl my hair and apply my makeup, and I wore the dress she bought. I actually looked pretty cute, not gonna lie. She looked so happy and wished me good luck as I walked out of the house in ballet pumps, not high heels. Those things are evil. The party wasn't until later, so I texted Garrett and told him to meet me at the coffee shop around the corner. Everything was set. There's only one last step left. 
So, in the first part of my story, my parents set me up on some blind dates. First, there was Trent, who ended up being gay, so that didn't work out. And then I met Corey, who wasn't far from being called my worst enemy. We hated each other, but still, he made me go on dates with him. And then it turned out he was also gay, and that Trent was actually his ex. Corey begged me to help him get Trent back. So let's see how Trent will react to this. I decided to casually ask Trent about his past relationships and stuff to see if he'd bring Corey up. He said he'd been so badly betrayed by his ex and that he still hadn't forgiven him for it. Clearly, he was talking about Corey. I didn't know what to do. It was killing me to see how miserable they both were. Seeing how Corey desperately wanted Trent back made me realize that he had changed. If he was given one more chance, he would never risk losing Trent a second time. So I decided to help them get back together. I told Corey about it first, and I have never seen him look so happy. And after that, we started getting on pretty well, because we didn't have to pretend to be dating anymore. We could just be ourselves. And guess what? He's not actually that bad. In fact, he was just like me, having to put up with his parents setting him up on stupid dates. He even told my parents that I was such an amazing girl. And after that, my parents started to respect me more. The only thing was, I couldn't let Trent know about my plan. In fact, Trent didn't even know that Corey and I knew each other. But from the way Trent spoke about Corey, I knew he still had feelings for him too. So all I had to do was set up a date for them and let fate handle the rest. I asked Trent to meet me for dinner and arranged with Corey to secretly show up later. But as soon as Trent saw Corey, his face went bright red and within a second flat, he was furious. He stood up and started yelling at us both and even pushed Corey out of the way as he stormed out. Every single person in the restaurant was staring at us, and I even heard some old couple whispering that I was clearly two-timing these guys, and I'd just been caught, and how embarrassing that was. Trent was really mad at me after that, so I had to try and get him to forgive me, and at the same time, try and persuade him to give it another go with Corey. I knew that Trent had a sweet tooth, so I started making cupcakes and cookies and leaving them on his doorstep. He never answered the door no matter how many times I knocked, and one time I left a three-tier chocolate cake at his door, and I overheard his neighbors talking. One of them said, Oh, when will she stop? What a desperate gold digger. And then the other looked at me and started shaking her head. She said, she clearly has no dignity. What kind of girl chases a boy like that? I was so embarrassed. I realized how needy I must have looked. So I ran back to my car, but before I got in, Trent came running after me. He had heard the neighbors too, and he'd realized how hard I'd been trying. He said to me, Crystal, stop it already. You keep trying to fix things that were never your fault to begin with. Well, at least he'd spoken to me again. I told him I was sorry, and I just missed hanging out with him. So he said he forgave me, but there was one more thing he wanted. I replied to him with the biggest smile on my face. Sure, anything for you, Trent. I'm all yours for today. Okay then, let's go to the theme park. It's been a while and I need something to relieve all this stress. He said, I'm pretty sure I started to sweat a little upon hearing that because I'm literally petrified of heights. So we went there and went on all the rides that Trent wanted to. And I had to close my eyes the whole time and spent most of the day clinging on to him out of fear. But Trent seemed to have a great time, and I was just glad to make him happy again. That was all that mattered. After that day, I was able to bring up Corey again, and I told him that he didn't have to take him back, but maybe he could just open his heart a little and give Corey a chance to explain himself. He reluctantly agreed, just so that I'd stop going on and on about it. And he did give him a chance. Well, not really a chance, but he did keep the gifts Corey sent instead of sending them right back. And he stopped blocking his number. They even started talking again. Anytime Trent replied to Corey, Corey would call me and tell me and he'd be so excited. And they even met up to have a serious chat about what had happened. Now there's no more bad blood between them and all that was left to do was for Corey to make a move to win Trent back. Corey started to shower Trent in love. He even bought him an annual pass to the theme park and backstage passes to his favorite singer. But still, Trent wouldn't budge. 
He was being nice to Corey, but he didn't seem to want to date him again, which was so weird. What was going on? Had Trent met another guy already? One day, I met up with Trent to talk over a drink. I jokingly asked him, Hey, are you seeing another guy? What about Corey? I mean, I know he hurt you in the past, but he's changed now. And honestly, you two were miserable before. Now that he's back in your life, you seem so much happier. I waited for him to reply, but he just stared at me, which was really weird and it made me blush. Had I just stepped out of line? I said to him, well then, come on, spill the beans. Who is he? Then he smirked and downed his drink and he said, the reason I'm so much happier is because yes, I have met someone. I knew it, I interrupted. Then I realized he wasn't finished speaking. He continued, but it's not a guy. It's a girl, and she's the reason why I can't be with Corey again. She made me realize that I'm actually bisexual, and I was surprised. I mean, I really loved Corey, so this girl kind of came out of nowhere and has blown me away with how incredible she is. I couldn't believe it. Oh my god, who is she? I said laughing. And then he went bright red and said, Crystal, come on, it's you. Duh. What, what? I was too shocked to even reply. My heart was beating so fast. Trent liked me? Honestly, I was so confused. I mean, Trent was gay. Why would he like me? I felt so awkward and I could feel his eyes on me. I knew he was waiting for me to say something. I looked up for a second and our eyes met and the tension in the air was so intense. I just couldn't stand it. I made up an excuse, saying I felt tired and that I needed to go home. Trent looked a bit upset, but still offered to drive me home. I turned him down, though, and said I'd take an Uber. I just needed some alone time. I couldn't stop thinking about what he'd said. It actually made sense. We had so much fun together. But because I'd known he was gay, I'd never really looked at him as boyfriend material. But what if he wasn't gay? I mean, could we be together? The more I thought about it, the more I realized I liked him too. But I had to forget about those feelings because what about Corey? I couldn't just steal the love of his life like that. He'd be heartbroken. I didn't sleep a wink that night. All kinds of questions constantly popped up in my head. The next day, Trent texted me first, asking, Did you sleep well last night? I hope what I said last night didn't keep you up all night. With a smiley face, I replied, Actually, I was awake the whole night. I've thought a lot about my feelings, but Trent, I don't want to hurt Corey. We can't do this. He then replied, Don't think too much. That doesn't matter. Just answer this one question. Do you have feelings for me? Just say yes or no. I don't know what was going through my mind, but at that moment, I guess I was just tired of things being so complicated. So I typed yes, then hit send. Okay, so now Trent knew I had feelings for him too, and he sounded so happy. He said I shouldn't worry and that we could work this out as long as our feelings were mutual. A few days later, Trent said he'd meet up with Corey to talk to him. I was way too anxious to ask Trent how it went, but then at midnight, Corey called me. I was terrified to answer. I knew he would yell at me, but to my complete surprise, he didn't. He sounded calm and said Trent had told him everything and that if I truly had feelings for him, I should go for it. He said, I've spent years away from the one I love, and I don't want the same thing to happen to you and Trent. It's too painful. You both deserve to be happy. Plus, you helped me so much. Thanks to you, I managed to clear things up with Trent, and just having him back in my life, even as a friend, is good enough for me. I'll find someone else, and it'll make me so happy to know you two are happy. I was so touched by what he said, I couldn't even respond. I just started crying and told him he'd definitely meet someone amazing soon. Even he sounded choked up, but he tried to hide it by laughing and calling me a crybaby. Now that I had his support, I decided to give it a go with Trent. We went on a date, and it was so fun. Seeing as it wasn't our first time hanging out, we were so comfortable around each other. And now that I knew he was interested in me, I noticed how much he gave me butterflies. It was amazing. Now we're officially a couple. 
turns out my parents are pretty good at playing Cupid, right? Hey guys, Stephanie here. I have a question for you. Promise to be honest, okay? Have you ever had a crush on one of your teachers? If yes, I guess you could somehow relate to my story. I'm going to tell you all about my super fine boyfriend, Joseph. I put so much effort into winning him over, but trust me, he was worth every second. So this all began last year when I was a sophomore at college, majoring in performing arts. When it came to boys my own age, blech, talk about boring. I didn't pay much attention to them as they were so childish and honestly, they just annoyed me. If I had to choose between dating some immature jerk or staying single forever, there was no contest. One day, I was over at my bestie Susie's place. We've been friends since forever, and even though we now went to different colleges, we still met up loads. As we were eating Susie's delicious homemade burgers, we talked about college, outfits, boys, you know, that kind of thing. That's when Susie told me all about the new professor at her college called Joseph. She described him as extremely handsome, tall, intelligent, sporty, and he owned a motorcycle. He sounded far too good to be true, so I convinced myself there must be a catch. Perhaps he had bad acne, or maybe he had a wife and three kids or something. He doesn't have acne, he's not married, and he looks like this. She held up her phone. On it was the image of a seriously hot guy. I grabbed the phone off her and scrolled through his social media pictures. Jeez, this guy was so fine. So what if I'd never met him? I knew I needed to make him mine. I needed a plan, so I begged Susie to help me out. She thought I was crazy, but hey, she'd been besties with me forever, so she knew I liked to go all out on things. She snuck me into class with her. It was economics. Boring! But staring at Joseph was worth it, and his voice was so dreamy. I knew I couldn't just sit there. I needed to make Joseph notice me. After class, I walked over to him, swished back my hair, and in my cutest voice said, Hey, great class, but there are a few points I'm struggling to understand. Perhaps you could help me out? He looked a bit awkward, but he agreed. I blabbed out a few questions about the class, and he waffled out some answers which I didn't understand. I knew I'd have to do better than this to keep his attention, so I continued to sneak into the class. One time, I pretended to fall out of my chair and feigned blacking out. I even dabbed white powder under my eyes before class so I looked extra weary. My hope was that he'd rush over to me and carry me to the infirmary. But no, some stupid other guy had taken that chance from him. Worse still, this doofus was so clumsy that as he was carrying me through the doorway, he knocked my arm against the door frame. Ouch! I bit down on my lip and kept my eyes closed. Jeez. Why had my amazing plan turned into a disaster? Ugh. I opened my eyes just in time to witness the nurse coming at me with a huge needle. I screamed out, jumped off the bed, and told her I was feeling much better now. Despite my failed plan in pretending to be sick, I immediately came up with another one. One day, I punctured my own bike tire, then pretended to sadly walk my bike to the parking lot and asked Joseph to give me a lift. He shook his head, said he was too busy, then whizzed off on his motorcycle. I stood there speechless. Worse still, I had to walk my bike all the way home. Another time, I waited until it was just him and me left in class. Then, on my way past him, I dropped my books. Then I said, oh no, how clumsy of me, as I bent down to pick them up. Oh yeah, I was also wearing my tightest pair of jeans. I didn't think that there's any way he could resist me in those but he didn't even help me pick my books up. Instead, he coughed to clear his voice, then said, Can you hurry up, please? It's my lunch break, and I haven't eaten since breakfast. Typical. I was there looking sexy, and all he could think about was his stomach. I wasn't going to give up now. I hadn't attended a bunch of yawn-inducing economics lectures for nothing. So, thanks to my social media snooping, I knew Joseph's birthday was coming up. On his actual birthday, I had a class with him. Talk about fate! So I brought him a cake and made the entire class sing happy birthday to him. Then I announced I had a special birthday surprise for him, and I sang out Louis Capaldi's Someone You Loved. The rest of the class whooped and cheered, but he just looked down at his desk. Okay, so this was getting frustrating. What did I need to do to get this guy's attention? Jeez, I tried everything already. That Friday, one of Susie's college friends was having a party. 
so I tagged along. I sat in the corner and moaned out to Susie how I felt like I was getting nowhere with Joseph. I just didn't get it. Whatever I did, he just didn't seem bothered. I moaned out, Susie, should I keep flirting with him? He didn't even lay an eye on me. He was such a tough guy, you know? Like an old boot. In fact, a rock had more personality than he did. Then Susie gave me a sign, but I kept saying, and maybe he was gay or something? Like, you see, he showed no interest in girls. That's when Susie hit my arm, and when I looked up, I was completely shocked. Joseph was right there, looking at me. While I froze in shock, he shook his head, then stormed off. Without even thinking, I immediately stood up, rushed after him, and apologized. He ignored me and hopped onto his motorcycle, so I jumped onto the back of it and refused to move. Please, I didn't mean what I said. Please, just listen to me. I begged. In the end, he passed me a helmet and told me to put it on. I couldn't help but feel excited. I'd wanted to ride on the back of his motorcycle ever since I'd first seen a picture of him on it. O-M-G. Now it was actually happening! Okay, so this wasn't how I envisioned it, but still, this was amazing. And I made sure to hug my arms tightly around his waist. Purely for safety purposes, of course. After about ten minutes, he stopped at a deserted road. I thought he was going to shout at me, but instead, he turned around and smiled at me. Wow! Without the frown on his face, he looked even hotter. So, what were you saying about me earlier? He asked. Um, nothing. It was just a misunderstanding. That's funny, because it sounded like you thought I had no personality, and, um, what was it? Oh, yes, you think I'm gay. I, um, I'm sorry. You might be gay. Um, it doesn't matter if you are. Um, and, um... You have a great personality. Suddenly, he leaned forward and kissed me. OMG, talk about amazing. I was shocked, but so happy, even though I didn't know what was going on. As soon as he pulled away, I pulled him back so we could continue kissing. Then he said, I'm not gay, and I like to think I have a dazzling personality. I just like playing with you, but it seems like there must be a long time for you to be more mature but it's okay. I'd train you then. Be my girlfriend. Turns out, he'd noticed me too, but he wanted to see what happened first. Also, he thought I needed to grow up a bit, as my stunts, although amusing, were a bit on the childish side. But he also found the amount of effort I went to to get his attention flattering. He told me how he'd only shown up at that party as he'd overheard me talking about it at college, and he wanted to come just because of me. I don't go to his classes anymore, which gives me far more time to concentrate on my actual classes. But we are now an official couple, and I couldn't be happier. So this is the story of how I ended up with the hottest boyfriend known to mankind. My advice to you is to be bold in the pursuit of love. As if you just sit around waiting for it to drop on your doorstep, well, you'll be waiting forever. Go get him, tiger! That's what I did, and it totally worked for me so there's no reason why it can't work for you, too. Have you ever met someone and known instantly that they are the one for you? I wish I'd realized sooner so that my teenage years hadn't been so full of drama and heartbreak. But you live and learn, right? And better late than never. By the way, I'm Versalise, and I'm 24 years old. It all began 14 years ago when I moved to New York and started at a new school. At that time, I assumed that moving from my hometown in France to New York would be no big deal. My mom and I were super excited and truly believed it would change our lives. Indeed, it did, but not in the ways I ever expected. On my first day at my new school, my mother insisted on driving me to school. When we arrived, I gave my mom a kiss on both of her cheeks and waved goodbye. My mom joked that she'd sort out any of the kids who dared to mess with me, I did feel quite shy, but I thought she was just joking. Turns out she wasn't. At lunchtime, I sat down at a random table, and suddenly this girl appeared and said, What do you think you're playing at, sitting at our table? I didn't even have time to reply before she picked up my lunch tray and threw it off the table right into the trash can. I said, Move, she said. Everyone was staring at us now. I was so upset, I just covered my face. I didn't want to be that crybaby in front of all these new people, but I couldn't help it. The tears started falling. 
Then something crazy happened. A voice boomed out through the cafeteria, saying, Get away from her! And then the next moment, I felt a hand reach out for my hand, and when I looked up, this gorgeous tall boy was standing there looking at me when he picked me up on my feet. Excuse me, the girl started, but the boy continued, What is wrong with you? Do you have a screw loose or something? Your attitude is so gross. It'll make me puke. You disgust me, and I don't want to be friends with someone like you. She stood there with her mouth wide open as he grabbed my hand and walked away. I could hear her scoff from behind me, but her facial expression looked as if she'd lost. I took his hand and followed him out of the cafeteria, and that's when he introduced himself as Ryder. We sat down outside, and he asked me if I was new around here, and then he told me he loved my accent. And he even offered me half of his baguette and said, Hey, come on, chin up. I'll be your friend, okay? The best part is that the girl who bullied me had a major crush on him, so she was probably even angrier at me now. But I didn't care one bit. After that, I can't remember a time when we were apart. We were glued at the hip and did everything together. He taught me how to skateboard, and I taught him how to bake my famous pastries. We were like the dream team. He made me laugh so much, and he helped me become more confident. Day by day, I could tell I wanted to be more than just his friend, but I didn't dare tell him that. Then my 12th birthday rolled around, and my mom gave me a diary. She told me to write down all of my thoughts, and even my crushes so that I could reflect back on it one day. Then she winked at me and walked away. Ew, what was she talking about? I didn't have a crush. Did I? Okay, who am I kidding? I had the biggest crush ever on Ryder. Every time I saw him, I felt like there were a million butterflies in my stomach, and I woke up excited every day because I knew I'd get to see him. And then the time came for our school dance, and my friends were teasing me that I should go with Ryder. I kept telling them he was just my friend, but I couldn't fool them. They saw right through me. Later that day, Ryder invited me over to play video games, and as we were playing, he said, Hey, um, wanna go to the dance with me? I couldn't believe it. My heart was thumping in my chest, but I tried to play it cool and said, Uh, sure, I guess. And you know what? We had the best time ever at the dance. I was for sure on cloud nine, and afterwards I decided to journal about it in my diary. I never wanted to forget that night. So I wrote pages upon pages of how Ryder made me feel and how I loved him so much. Little did I know how everything was about to change. A few days later, Ryder came over to my house, and as soon as I saw him, I had the biggest grin on my face. But quickly that grin faded when Ryder said he had something to tell me. I have some bad news. My family and I are moving to London in a month. This is a joke, right? Come on, stop playing around, I said, trying to hide the worry in my voice. But he just stayed quiet, and by then I knew he wasn't joking. I couldn't hold back the tears, and Ryder just reached out and held me in his arms, comforting me. He told me it would be okay, and we'd still keep in touch, but I felt like my whole world was crumbling around me. This was the worst news of my life. We decided to make our last month together the most fun we'd ever had. We went surfing, skateboarding, stargazing, and even did karaoke. I never wanted that month to end, but of course it did. On our last night together, we had a slumber party and stayed up all night waiting for the sun to rise. When it came time to say goodbye, he gave me a framed photo of the two of us and said if I ever felt sad, I could just look at it and remember the happy times. I wanted to tell him how I felt, but I couldn't, and so he left. I was so down that I ran upstairs and covered myself under the blanket and cried. Later that night, as usual, I was about to write my day in my diary when it was nowhere to be seen. I shouted at my mom and blamed her, but she just said I must have misplaced it. Now I had no writer and no diary. My life sucked. Summer quickly ended and it was time for high school. Even though I had my friends, my life wasn't the same without writer. But life goes on, and so eventually I tried to move on from writer. My friends told me that this guy Lucas had always had a crush on me, and maybe I should give him a chance. Well, soon we started dating, 
And even though I didn't have the same special connection with him as I had with Ryder, it was still fun, and it took my mind off of things. Fast forward seven years, and Lucas and I were still together. The relationship wasn't great, but I had my dream job and was living in my dream loft apartment, so I couldn't complain too much. Plus, Ryder had drifted away from my mind. I decided it was time to really put some work into my relationship with Lucas. So one night, I told him I was working late and booked us a surprise trip to Paris. When I got home, I was so excited to tell Lucas, so I ran up to our bedroom, and to my complete horror, I found him lying in our bed kissing another girl. They didn't even notice me at first. So I screamed, What are you doing? Well, that got their attention, and the girl ran off. I thought Lucas would apologize, but he just said, What do you expect? You won't give me what I want, and you make me wait for marriage. Then he stomped out of the room and said, I can have any girl I want. I was so shocked. I just dropped to the floor and burst into tears. Finally, he showed me his true colors, and so I kicked him out. The next few weeks were some of the worst of my life, even worse than when Ryder moved to London. I felt so stupid for wasting so much time with Lucas. One night, I was particularly sad, and I suddenly remembered the framed photo Ryder had given me. I dug it out of the back of my wardrobe and held it close to my heart. My friends called me, tried to get me to go out with them. They did everything to help lift my mood up, but I wasn't interested. I just needed time alone to process everything. I thought to myself about how the only person I wanted to see now was Ryder. But where was he? How was he doing? I had no idea at all. Another depressing week went by. I was lounging on my couch, soullessly staring at the TV in boredom. Then suddenly there was a knock at the door. I went to open it, and oh my god, Ryder was standing there. Was this real or was I hallucinating? I was so surprised I just jumped into his arms and didn't want to let go. We must have stood there hugging for ages. And then suddenly Ryder said, I have something of yours. When I let go of him, he was holding my diary. Turns out Ryder had been in touch with my mom, and when she told him about my cheating boyfriend, he decided to come to New York and cheer me up. And then reality hit. He'd taken my diary? What if he'd read it? Well, he had, and he said that's why he'd come to see me, because he wanted to talk to me about it all. I was blushing like crazy. And then he said, I've always loved you, V. Even when we were kids, I've never stopped thinking about you, and I want to be with you. Then he reached over and kissed me, and I swear time just stopped. I'd been waiting for this moment my whole life. That week was like a haze of kissing and chatting and catching up on lost time. He told me about his ex-girlfriends, and I told him about Lucas and the cheating. Then I plucked up the courage and asked him if he'd like to go to Paris with me, seeing as the trip was already booked. Of course he said yes, and the next week we flew there and had the best week of our entire lives. We went to the Eiffel Tower and even visited my old neighborhood where I'd grown up. It was magical. And then one day Ryder said he had to do a bit of work and told me to go pamper myself at a local spa. When I was done, I had a text from him asking to meet him on the roof of our hotel. He was so romantic like that. I first went back to the hotel room where he'd laid out a black sparkly dress for me to wear, and then I headed up to the roof. I couldn't believe it! There were almost 1,000 roses laid out to form a path. And at the end of the path was Ryder wearing a suit. I love you, V, he began to say. I always have, and I can't imagine a life without you. Will you marry me? I gasped in shock and screamed, yes, at the top of my voice. I'd loved him ever since I was a kid, and now my dream of being together forever had finally come true. I guess it took us some time to reach this point, but the best things in life are worth waiting for, right?